around unusually that in Vermont these days. Um, my name is Sandal Kate, and I'm here in a kind of a semi-official capacity as the president of the East Montpelier Historical Society. And back in, I want to say, late winter, um, our group of program planners met, and I knew that this church was having a big celebration this month. And um, with the Callus Historical Society and ourselves, we thought, well, it would be wonderful to learn more about the history of this building. And back then, I had no idea that someone was typing very quickly on his computer or whatever he was using to write the story that we're going to hear tonight. So um, we were able to just wonderfully expand this um, gathering tonight to include all of you folks. Um, and I think that there's going to be eventually a recording of this evening's talk. And I'm not sure how that will be broadcast, but if you keep your ear to the ground, perhaps you'll find out. So um, I don't have a whole lot else to say. This is not where I go on Sundays, but um, I've been participating a little bit with the history committee from this church um, to put on um, an exhibit that is, has just gotten displayed in the parish house. And David Sheets is a good person, perhaps. I don't know if is it Sally Smith who displayed the sheet. She's away. Okay, she's away. Anyway, um, but I will let you know, and perhaps you'll hear this again, that the exhibit for the month of October is that of prints of original paintings by James Franklin Gilman, who was an itinerant painter back in the late. 1800s, and he created just these, I feel, exquisite images of many homes and farms and other buildings in Central Vermont back then. And that's a whole different story. On October 1st, which is the first Sunday of the four Sundays in October, the parish house will be open from 1 o'clock until 4 o'clock for folks to stop by hopefully during some remnant foliage season, to see the prints. On October 1st, from about 1 o'clock until 2 o'clock, we um, have invited a number of folks who live on or near the various um, location premises of some of Gilman's work um, to just tell maybe a little bit about how the history of the place has evolved since Mr. Gilman was there. So um, hopefully you'll have a chance to see that work um, on Sunday afternoon. Now, yes, Barbara? Oh, you might mention the map. I'm sorry? Uh, there's a map that, um, that shows you where, uh, where each picture was done, and you can buy the map for $5 and take it. Okay, so Barbara Kluf has just augmented that by saying that there's actually a map that matches the locations of the various uh, buildings and farms. And I will tell you that East Montpelier Elementary School does a wonderful program with their third and fourth graders, teaching them about their community, and they learn about Mr. Gilman. And I'll just, I'm kind of getting us off the path, but, um, and one of them said, oh, so he was like the Mount Branch of East Montpelier. <laughs> and I said, good for you. And, and they also have done a school tour along this idea of doing a self-tour, self-guided tour. So anyway, to get you back to this building, um, I'm very delighted that Tom Schmidt um, and his work, um, which you'll learn all about tonight, um, tells a wonderful story of a strong building that is with us 200 years later from the time it was built. So maybe on a cool rainy night, we can give a warm welcome to author Tom Schmidt. I'll try to make eye contact there in the middle.
Um, thank you, Sandal. A couple of housekeeping items before I begin. Uh, still not coming through. Got to get this up closer, closer, closer. All right. I almost have to swallow it. All right. A couple of housekeeping items before I begin. One is there are restrooms uh, down the hall in the, in the parish hall. You go in there, turn right, make another right, and there's one little restroom there. And uh, if you time it just right, I won't think I said something to insult you when, when you leave. Uh, or you can work it out if I do, that that would be a time to use the restroom. The other is that we do have copies of the book available. Um, it's called uh, Presence in the Center, a Bicentennial History of the Old Meeting House, with kind of a cool uh, drone photograph uh, from above on the cover. And these are available, it's $25 cash or check. Uh, that barely covers the cost of printing. Uh, there's nothing in it for me, I promise. Uh, if I'm going to get rich and famous, it's not going to be from this book. Um, but uh, but we, uh, we hope you enjoy it. And my wife, Mary, will be available afterwards at a little table here to uh, take your money and give you a book. They're all signed. If that makes them worth less or more, I'm not sure. Uh, <clears throat> Sandal asked me to say a little about uh, who I am and how the project got started. And I'd rather keep that to a minimum and talk more about the building and its history. But uh, many, many years ago, I did a PhD in humanities and taught for 30 some years, wrote a dozen books in different genres, and more recently, my primary interest has been in poetry. But one day in January, we were having a formation meeting, talking as a committee about what kinds of things we might do for the bicentennial, and dear David Sheets suggested, somebody ought to write a history of the church. And I just blithely said, well, I think I could do that. Well, I was thinking maybe 75, 80 pages, and uh, it's now 250 pages with dozens of photographs and 75 sources quoted and all these endnotes. And uh, once you get started, it just becomes this tar baby and you know, pulls you in. But for me, it was very enjoyable because it allowed me to uh, kind of rebuild some long atrophied research muscles and look at all kinds of different sources, some that were provided to me by others. For example, Nathan Phillips, known to many of you, was a wonderful sleuth who provided uh, a lot of newspaper articles and made a couple of incredible finds in the Vermont Historical Society Library. Uh, Barb Plouf, uh, as a member of the Old Meeting House, has been keeping archives for decades and was an incredible source of, of help and information. And I can't neglect to mention my own wife, Mary, who is not only a superb editor and proofreader, but she really excused me from most or all household duties for months, <laughs> provided tea and snacks in my basement cubby hole, and in fact, locked me down there for days at a time and <laughs> just dropped little bits of food down the laundry chute because we, I had self-imposed deadlines to get this done. And in fact, the copies came from the printer on Monday. And we had our bicentennial celebration yesterday. So uh, yeah, it's a little bit of a close call. Uh, and it depended on the efforts of a, a lot of people besides me, obviously. Well, many of you were present yesterday for that celebration. And I expect that um, some of you will learn what you want to learn by reading the book. Others of you are new to the area or to the history of the area. And then there's some of you who know far more than I know about certain aspects of local history, especially those that don't necessarily pertain directly to the church's development. So my intention tonight is simply to highlight some of the more unusual discoveries of my research and to do this in chronological order, telling stories rather than lecturing and pausing between tales for your questions and comments before moving on. I've chosen seven stories. They vary in length. And uh, if we don't have time for all of them, then uh, I'll just let you go and I'll just keep talking or we'll <laughs> arrange for another meeting. We'll, we'll figure it out somehow. Or I'll just talk faster. Uh, the first I've uh, given the not very creative title, 1820 and The Grove in the Center. <laughs> 
The history of the old meeting house really begins in 1787, when a 21-year-old young man walked barefoot, as far as we know, 200 miles from Massachusetts with his uncle and his brothers, maybe one or two pack horses, to survey the 40 miles, square miles of newly charted Montpelier. Many of you know his name was Parley Davis. He picked this spot right around this building, the geographic middle of the area, and therefore it has been called the center ever since. That's why. There were no roads here. It was all trees. Vermont was 99% trees. The 1% were ponds and rivers. Everything else was trees, and they were huge. If it was light enough and you looked out the window, you'd see some 50 or 60 foot trees out here. They were two and three times that height then. So even seeing where you were had to be an incredible challenge. No roads, no paths. He just showed up here and he liked this spot because there were big trees that were widely spaced and he decided this will be my home and this will be the town or city of Montpelier. Wrong, but that was his intention. This road outside, incidentally, eventually became a road from the trail that went down to the river and back, and it ended up going all the way to Canada. It wasn't paved until the 1960s, but what you drove up on to come into the parking lot of the church was the equivalent in the 1780s of the Interstate 91. This was how you got from that little village that was forming down by the river to Canada. And uh, you're on the main route. Again, didn't turn out that way as it was originally envisioned. Well, the next part of this uh, interesting aspect of the story occurs in 1796, when a new religious group called the Methodists began sending missionaries into the wilds of Vermont. They had been in the more settled areas of New England and in the South where they'd become well established, but they decided to come here and they sent a giant of a man named Jesse Lee who showed up in Barrie and preached and made his first com converts in Barrie. Uh, the converts were grouped in what were called classes and when they got enough classes together, they would have enough people to form a church. Well, we don't know exactly who or when or where, but at some point in the next 10 to 15 years, there were enough classes within a couple of miles of where we're sitting or standing here that there were 100 Methodists in this area, and it was time to take the next step. This group of classes of Methodists were rewarded by the denomination uh, with a, an annual regional conference that took place somewhere around here. And I'll come back to that and the content of that conference in a little bit. But the interesting question at this point is, just where was it that they met? One of them, Henry Nutt, who lived in the Nut House uh, <laughs> and the Nut Farm down at the end of Bliss Road, decades later told a local historian that they met in the Grove in the Center. Now that particular phrase makes it sound like it was something established and familiar to people at the time. Where was it? We know that wherever this group of Methodists met, they would cho choose a central location where they could all gather from the farms in the area. We know they would need to meet near a road where they could all see where the others were. They couldn't just go off in the woods somewhere. We know that it would be very convenient for them to have their meetings near a large barn where they could meet during inclement weather, of which we have a lot. This spot checked all those boxes. The barn would have been Parley Davis's barn across the street. He built a large house, which still stands. And um, I think most of you are familiar with that, just across the street. And there was a large barn that's no longer there. Davis, uh, we have a, a couple of other hints about where this location may have been too, because Davis and some other neighbors decided that they would make this area around here the eventual town. And so they set aside four acres, half on Davis's property and half on the neighbor's property to be the ultimate town center. And of course they left the trees here because the trees would be useful 
to build the buildings. Everywhere else, they cut the trees down, all of them. By 1870, Vermont was 15% tree cover. And most of that was in the Northeast Kingdom. It's now back to 85%. So what you see around here with all these trees and little woods is really growth from the middle of the 20th century. And uh, at the end of the 18th century, they just mowed it all down and they burned the big hardwood trees for potash, which was a cottage industry in the early decades of the 19th century. And a lot of people made more money selling potash than they did farming. And so they just cut all the trees down. Well, we have another hint about where the location might have been of this uh, group of people, because um, we know that um, I mentioned uh, that there were trees around here, and I mentioned the size of them. Some of these trees were pine trees in a grove that were probably about 150 feet tall. How do we know that? Because you're sitting on them. If you look down or behind you, these are single plank pew backs and single plank pew bottoms. And to get something that big, you had to have trees that tall. We can also go up in the rafters and see what was hewn and milled to form the skeleton of the building. And they were enormous pines. Very little hardwood was used here. And of course, um, because they built all of this in the winter and spring, they couldn't just haul the trees up from a lumber yard somewhere. They had to do it all here. And uh, it would have been very difficult, especially in the muddy part of the year. But I'll, I'll get back to that. There's one more hint about where this group of people met for 20 or so years before the church was built. And that's under the floor. Uh, if I move, I'll carry the mic with me. If I move over here, right underneath where I'm standing, uh, you see when you walk up to the church, a nice rock ledge all the way around. It looks pretty level. And you'd imagine it's all just dirt underneath. But underneath where I'm standing is about 100 square feet of ledge protruding from the ground, gently sloping down toward the road. And right where I am now is a rocky outcropping that forms a natural pulpit or a place to stand or to stand behind. So this would have been ringed by big trees and it would have been open to the road. A natural amphitheater, basically an outdoor church before there was ever an indoor church. So it's not absolutely certain, but it's highly likely that you're standing on the spot that around 1805, 1810, somewhere in there, the original evangelistic meetings took place in the trees to form the Methodist Society, which ended up forming the church. So that's story number one. Before I go on, uh, have I inspired any uh, questions about any of those aspects of the story? Um, I've said everything, I guess. <laughs> yes, yes. Probably, but as far as I know, we've looked at the lumber here and it's uh, definitely pine. And I mean, you can obviously see the pine planks and pine floorboards. There could be some spruce in the rafters. I haven't investigated in that much detail. It's kind of fun to crawl around up there, but, uh, uh, and I'll tell you a little later about the steeple. That's interesting too. Uh, story number two, or a series of link stories, uh, 1822, an uneasy alliance. And for a lot of this, I'm very indebted to Nathan Phillips because he was nosing around in Barrie in the library and he found a book by a woman named Sophie Damon written in 1887 called Old New England Days. Sounds like kind of a standard Victorian story. Turns out Sophie Damon was Parley Davis's granddaughter. And this book, although it's ostensibly a novel, is not a novel at all, it's a memoir. All she did was change the name Davis to Allwood and told the story of her mother, Ruth, and her aunt, Hannah, growing up right here in the 18-teens and 1820s. It's all about this time period and this place. One of the most interesting stories that I didn't include in the book because it's not directly related to the church, but it is related to this story. September 4th, 1814, Little Ruth Davis' father, Parley, was off with the Montpelier area militia in an attempt to drive the British out of New York. Ruth was playing in the road 
She says in the clearing, essentially describing about this spot, she was playing with a couple of girlfriends and she heard military music and she looked up the road and she saw soldiers coming up over the hill just past Fred Strong's house. And she went screaming back to the house saying, mommy, the British are coming, the British are coming. <laughs> and her mother knew better and came out and was met by the leader of the regiment of the second Maine militia who had walked all the way here and they were on their way to the Battle of Plattsburgh. Well, they were hungry and here was one big house. There were 500 of them. She emptied the larders. They spent the day here. Uh, they drank all the cider from the casks from the orchard that was over there, and then they went on their way. I was interested in particular in the cider detail because I live right up there on the uh, one edge of what was Parley Davis's property, and there are a few uh, volunteer apple trees up there still. One very, very old one died just two years ago, and I was a little excited about it dying so I could cut it and count the rings. Well, alas, it was rotten in the middle. So I don't know, but I believe deep in my heart that that was one of Parley Davis's apple trees that produced the cider that the Maine militia drank on their way to the Battle of Plattsburgh. And if you know your history, you know they got there too late. Uh, I said it was September 11th when they scared Sophie or scared Ruth and marched down the road here. Uh, the battle was actually, uh, no, th that was September 14th. The battle was September 11th. So they missed it by three days. But Parley Davis and the local militia made it in time and in fact suffered several casualties before they came home. I don't know what happened to the main militia if they came back this way or not. Maybe they figured they, they ate and drank them out of house and home, so maybe they should go over to the 91 and you know, go up across on the two, I don't know. Um, the story moves ahead a few years to 1818 and a sad chapter, but a very important one as part of the history of this place, because that's when Ruth's older sister Asenath died uh, of some lingering disease, um, we're not sure what. Um, and the Reverend Chester Wright, who was the only local minister, was asked to come up from the village down by the river to conduct the funeral. Parley and Rebecca Davis did not want the Reverend Chester Wright to conduct the funeral, but he was the only clergyman in the area. He was the pastor of the Puritan Calvinist Congregational Church, the only place in town with a permanent pastor. There were two other groups. The Methodists, of course, in 1818 hadn't formed this church yet, but they were here and their pastor was itinerant. He traveled all around central Vermont. Likewise, the Universalists. That's where Parley and Rebecca Davis's uh, loyalties were, but those ministers were out of town preaching elsewhere. This is where the plot thickens. The Universalists were not um, like today's Unitarian Universalists, uh, whose motto is free and responsible search for truth and meaning, a very rational approach to the spiritual life. At the time, Universalists, when they were founded, were very orthodox, conservative Protestants, belief in Jesus, salvation, the miraculous, all the rest, with one exception. They rejected the doctrine of hell. They believed that salvation was universally available, hence the name, and that God would use even a period of time in the afterlife in hell to turn people toward his love. That's where the idea of universalism came from. Well, that was rejected by the Methodists and the Calvinists. And in fact, when Chester Wright came up here to preach his sermon, he consigned Asenath Davis to hell in his funeral oration because she was not a Calvinist congregational and, a, and congregationalist, and therefore not one of the elect. You can imagine how this went over with the family and the locals. Uh, and Sophie Damon includes this very touching account of that night when little Ruth was trembling and, and crying in bed, imagining her poor sister in the fires of hell, and her mother came in to comfort her and explained, we do not believe the things that those people believe. And she went on basically to explain universalist doctrine to her daughter. And it's there in Sophie Damon's memoir. And then the next day in the newspaper appeared 
an obituary explaining that Asenath Davis loved Jesus, was saved by Jesus, went to heaven to be with Jesus, and her last words were, Jesus, come quickly. So there, Reverend Wright. <laughs> There's no name on that obituary, but I'm guessing Rebecca Davis. <clears throat> Part of what's interesting about that is it shows what fierce competition there was between the different religious sects at the time. Some of them actually came to physical blows and went to each other's meetings to heckle and try to pick fights. The Universalists and the Methodists and the Congregationalists were the three main groups here who were vying for converts and for the loyalty of the locals. The Methodists won, to put it plainly. The Universalists were very popular in the area. They were a, a, a main force behind the old Brick Church uh, in the East Village, the old West Church, the North Montpelier Church, and all around, but they never really caught on here. Parley Davis tried. He actually paid for the Universalist minister uh, to come here and preach from time to time, in spite of the fact that the Methodists had the church. The Methodists published in their own documents don't have anything to do with the Universalists, and the Universalists didn't have anything to do with them, and of course the Calvinists consigned them all to hell. So it was not a big kumbaya moment of ecumenism in the late 18th century, and I'll get back to that later, but uh, things are very tame now compared to uh, the way they were then. Um, in 1820, when the Methodists were invited to have this big powwow and camp meeting right here where we sit, their speaker, their keynote speaker, was the Reverend William Fisk, Wilbur Fisk, I'm sorry. You may have heard the name, and some of you are historians, may be thinking of the Civil War diarist. Uh, any of you have heard of that Wilbur Fisk? He was named after the Wilbur Fisk I'm talking about, but they were no relation. That was a school teacher. It was just the, the name is coincidence. I actually just learned that today. Um, because I was wondering, was he his son or his grandson? No, the Wilbur Fisk who preached here in the grove at the center was the leading intellectual light of Methodism in this area. He was a Vermonter. He became the first president of Wesleyan University. Uh, he was influential in the legislature here. He was a, a, a leader in a temperance movement, and he was an integral part of the abolitionist movement in the early decades of the 19th century before it was fashionable uh, nationwide, the Methodists spearheaded abolitionism uh, in, in Vermont and in New England. The sermon title that day in 1820 in that camp meeting by Wilbur Fisk was Endless Misery. Now, of course you're chuckling because it sounds like a hellfire and brimstone sermon, but in fact, it was not a denunciation of the heathen and the lost, it was a denunciation of the universalists. Because if you die without being saved, you experience endless misery, not temporary misery, until you get your act together in the afterlife and turn to Jesus. And everybody needed to understand that. What's interesting about that, and you may be a step ahead of me, is that he was preaching on land owned by the leading universalist in the area, Parley Davis, on land that Parley Davis would end up leasing to those Methodists to build this church and send his own kids there to listen to Methodist doctrine and finance and become the primary financier of the church, buying two-thirds of the pews that you're sitting in in order to build the church. Why would he do that? Because he wanted a town. And in order to have a town, you've got to have a church. And the only people who had the money and the interest in building a church were his neighbors, the Methodists. So they got the church. But what's interesting is when you read the lease and the agreement to build the church, what you see is after the boilerplate information about who's going to build the church and what it's going to look like, the document says that other religious groups can use the building when the Methodists aren't using it. That was the compromise. It's there in the, in the contract and it's there in the land lease. Again, it wasn't a kumbaya moment of, oh, let's all, we all just believe in one God. No, it was Parley Davis comp making a compromise, uh, saying, okay, you guys get the building, but it's my land, I'm building the church, and they're gonna be universalists in here too when you're done. <laughs> And they're going to be Congregationalists, including Chester Wright, who's going to come up here and consign us all to hell. 
Uh, and that's the way to do it because he was a very broad-minded person that way. And he and Rebecca told their daughters to come over here and listen to all three groups, which they did. And his daughter Ruth became a universalist. And his daughters Hannah and Rebecca became devout Methodists. And they married the brothers Pitkin and became very important citizens here. Pitkin, I'll mention again later, became a general uh, in the Civil War uh, effort to provide uh, materials for the troops. Very influential group of people. And they too were Methodists. In fact, they sat in this pew right here where Carol with them is sitting. Uh, and uh, that, was, uh, that was the one pew they kept. He sold all the rest, but the family sat there. I doubt if Rebecca and Parley came here very often, uh, except when the Universalists were here, but their daughters sat there. That was the family pew. I also would mention that the book is available. You can actually get it online, Sophie Damon's book, Old New England Days. It's also in the Vermont Historical Library. And I don't have time to detail this, but there's a very moving tribute to her mother and her aunt and their religious differences that were, the dispute was in a context of great love in the family. So they had their differences, a Universalist and a Methodist in the same household, and different uh, outlook on the way God would reveal himself and guide people, but they all did it in a very loving way. So however disputatious the area was in terms of the religious groups, there was one family that uh, we would probably agree got it right in terms of agreeing to disagree in, uh, in the context of love in one home. Questions before I go on to... Uh, Third story. There's a lot there. Eric. Oh, okay. I need to get closer to the mic, or how am I doing for others? Am I, am I coming through okay, or I need to get, I need to, I get carried away, and, or would it be better if I just did this? That, I've got a hand free. I only need to wave one arm, so, okay. Okay. Yes, Sandal. Good question. Who else was forming churches? The Congregationalists had their church downtown. Uh, the uh, Old Brick Church came next. Uh, well, actually, I'm sorry, the Old West Church was just the next year, 1823, as many of you know. And that, my understanding, was primarily Universalist to begin with. And then the Old Brick Church, likewise. And uh, later, you know, they all changed. North Montpelier came, I think, in the 1830s. Uh, I'm not exactly sure. And then the Methodists also built a church that's no longer standing downtown near the courthouse in the 1830s or 40s. And then Trinity Methodist, the big one in 1874, that became the established Methodist church. Uh, but nothing else around here. Well, except for the Free Will Baptists who started coming over from Maine. Free Will Baptists. And they had itinerant Yes. Who were right. The Free Will Baptists were trying, and if you've driven around Maine or even northern Vermont, you'll see that they established some churches, but they, they never really got a good foothold here. Although we'll return to that part of the story because uh, in the middle decades of this, uh, the last century, in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, this was, and the Old Brick Church had Baptist ministers. Um, so th they, they never disappeared, but they didn't build a church in the area. 1822, realizing the vision. Now we come to the building itself. Lovell Kelton, a name that many of you know, took the commission at least to frame the church in 1822, and he built the Old West Church a year later. We don't know who was on the crew. We have a couple of names. It would have taken... At, on some days, when they were raising the frame, it would have taken dozens or scores of people, but we know almost no names, and we don't know who did the finish work or the interior, whether it was Lovell or someone else. We have his diary, and he was doing other things at the time, so there had to be a crew. He was helping build other barns. He, had, he and his sons were working on their own farms, and all of this was going on in 1822. It's also a little odd that the uh, 
church was, the agreement to build the church was made in April 1822, and they finished the framing in August. Bad timing, because they had to start in the mud, and they had to work all through the haying season, and the normal time to do this would have been late fall through the winter. And you think, oh, it's cold. Yeah, but you can slide the logs. They don't sink down into the ground and neither to the wheels of the vehicles you're using or the hoofs of the animals you're using. So a lot of the heavy construction and lumber processing was done in the winter. But they did it in the spring and we don't know why. Uh, in fact, it turned out to be kind of a hurry up and wait situation because they finished framing in 1822 and they presumably put the roof on and then nothing happened. They didn't actually finish until late 1825 and dedicate the church in January 1826. January 26th, 1826. Lovell Kelton's diary says it was a cold and blustery day. That's the only reference we have to the dedication of the church. <laughs> Why the coldest day of the year to dedicate the church and what happened in between? Well, it's a pretty good guess they ran out of money. They did some other subscribing, uh, sold some more pews, did what they could to raise money in between. And this building, once it was framed and roofed, was probably the workshop uh, where a lot of the finish work was done inside underneath. It took three plus years to finish. We're looking at the finished product here, but the construction itself, I think, is fascinating. First, you had to chop down all these enormous trees around here and not stand underneath them while they're falling. Mm -hmm. And then you have to mill them or hew them into shape. And if you looked up above this plaster in the ceiling, you'd see it's a combination of hand hewing and actually milling the lumber. There was a lumber mill run by this little creek over here a couple hundred yards up the road, owned by Parley Davis, I believe, at the time. And uh, it was owned by several people over time. And that's where the wood for the church was milled including the, the wood for all of the windows, all of the pews, all of the trim, everything you see was done on site because Miles and Abishan were not open that day. <laughs> and everything had to be done here. Everything was done with mortise and tenon. There are no nails in this building. In fact, if you look at the ends of the pews, you might see the little pegs where the mortise and tenons were attached uh, to make the pews. The only nails in this building are the nails that attach the siding on the outside. And if you look carefully on a bright day, you'd see that they're square headed. They had to be made uh, one by one and forged. And the window glass came from elsewhere. Everything else you see had to be done on site. The plaster was mixed and made on site. The paint was made from, uh, ox the white paint on the outside was made from oxidized lead mixed with linseed oil. And this is the original plaster. Uh, there have been several coats of paint on the outside. This is the original green, although it's been repainted. And the trim was, uh, the little trim boards here were once dark red. Uh, but everything else is original. And of course, uh, the pews have never been uh, painted or stripped or anything. This is, this is what they were and what they still are. How did they build it? Well, they first put down the foundation and then they built the floor. And then that whole wall of timbers was all made and fashioned here with mortise and tenon and laid on the floor. Then this entire wall weighing multiple tons was all assembled in place and laid on top of the back. Then this wall was all made in place and laid here. We know they did it in this order because this side is higher. So you would start here, you get a group of about 30 to 50 men here. They would stand on the edge of the top of that wall up there and push as high as they could. And then another group of men would come behind them with poles, shove it up a little further. And they probably had oxen over here with rope and tackle to pull it up to vertical. So they did the two walls, the back wall, and then they had this U shape then they would build uh, the front of the church and the steeple. What's interesting about the steeple is if you go up, you can see a little attic hole there. If you just move that attic board out of the way and looked up there with a flashlight, you'd see that the lowest part of the steeple is very open, great big beams with a big hole in the middle. They had no crane, 
So the only way to get the second part and the third part and the cupola up there was to do a telescope. So they built the second part and shoved it up, and then they had that all attached, then put the third part up there and shoved it up. I don't know how they got the copper cupola up at the top because it's welded or soldered together and it must weigh several hundred pounds. There were no cranes, and I don't think they had helicopters, <laughs> um, but they had oxen, rope and tackle, and they had some, some pretty fancy um, uh, leverage systems, but no cranes. So that creates the shell, but now you don't have a roof yet. So now comes the dangerous part. They've got to put beams all the way across here with temporary uh, supports. These two, these uh, um, posts here um, support the um, ceiling, but not the roof. So once they got up there, they'd have a platform, and then the really dangerous work began because these are very heavy timbers, and they go from the edge all the way to the top, and there are multiple supports inside. So they've got to figure out how to do all that up in the air. And then, this is the part that amazes me, there's a 55-foot ridge pole that goes along the center, and it's pentagon-shaped so that the sides of it meet those uh, trusses at angles, and the top of it is a nice peak. It's got to weigh, I don't know, four or five tons. It's about eight inches at the base and about a foot thick in the middle. How did they get it up there? Well, two theories we've toyed around with. One is that they put it on end and very carefully rocked it onto the top and then used oxen to pull it over until it was in the right place. Another option is they put it over on the side and got oxen over on the other side and had them walk that way and slowly pulled it up to the ridge and dropped it in place. I don't know. I, those things are fascinating to me to think how they did that. Um, because there are no details left behind. We know most of it from descriptions of other churches built elsewhere. And of course, Amish barns, uh, which are built in a similar fashion today, although they tend to build section by section all the way through rather than wall, 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 and then ceiling. So uh, fascinating the way they did that. Once they finished, they had no heat. These wood stoves are actually fairly modern. Uh, there was no heat in the building until 1854 when they put the first wood stoves in. So when the congregation started, there were 150 to 200 people in here every week, including about 100 children for services that lasted two or three hours. And you must sit still and listen, children. And there was no heat. And that's part of the reason these pews are all enclosed. People would come with horse blankets and little heated rocks or portable heaters, like a little coal with a tin, and they would put it inside their little area and huddle in. I was amazed to learn that throughout New England, people commonly brought their dogs to church too. And these were not chihuahuas. So you can imagine the chaos at the beginning of the service when all the dogs <laughs> were greeting each other, but I imagine they were very useful on those winter days uh, to, to lie on your feet. Uh, and Pastors all over New England complained about the dogs and the food scattered around and the people chewing and spitting tobacco. And it was just, it was a mess uh, until the Methodists, of course, cleaned it all up. No smoking, no chewing, no drinking, no spitting. I don't know how they felt about the dogs. But uh, a lot of people packed in here. The outside is interesting, too. I'll just say a little about that before going to the next story. We're used to seeing white clapboard churches in New England with the, you know, they all look the same, right? If you're coming through here as a tourist, this one is a little smaller and it's, you know, pretty proportions, but is it really that unusual? Well, in fact, it is. Uh, we have to understand that this is a federal style building, but this was a revolutionary period of time, quite literally. This was built just after the American Revolution. The idea of separation of church and state was gaining strength. And the idea of combining churches with meeting houses was becoming obsolete. Instead, churches were being built to look like churches. They were rectangular, they had pulpits at one end, and they had big steeples with crosses on them on the other end, and you entered through the steeple end normally. Very different from the uh, New England meeting house design that we're familiar with. The Old West Church, interestingly, was built a year later, but it's a somewhat earlier design. It's larger, it's squarer, the pews are square, 
Uh, and uh, there are quite a few details that are different about that that we could go into detail on another occasion, but I won't today. So even though they're a year apart, this is a, a somewhat more progressive design and a little more radical or revolutionary. Again, once it's 200 years old, it doesn't seem like that. It's hard to imagine what the modern equivalent of something like that might be. Fourth story, which links into this one, 1823 to 1826, the mystery of the interior. This is an unusual design because the, the pulpit is on the wrong end. Every other church you go into in New England, you'll walk in the doors and see the pulpit at the other end. Another unusual feature that you don't see very often, and you probably wouldn't know this, is the graceful curved balcony. And a third, um, which holds up the choir, a third feature that's unusual is not only the coved ceiling, which makes for terrific acoustics, but it's a double coved ceiling, because if you twist around, you'll see that the two coves meet in the corners of the church, and that's not easy to do if, like me, you've ever done any carpentry or home remodeling to try to get two curves to meet perfectly at the end. Ain't easy, uh, and it makes for terrific acoustics. Even the pews are unusual in design for this period, these long, straight box pews, one per family. Well, all of that's unusual, and we wondered, are there any churches around that have any of these features? Well, one of our own members who's here tonight, Judy Granger, had a hunch that maybe this had something to do with Rebecca Davis and her family history back in New Hampshire. She told me about this, and I thought, why would there be any connection? Well, turns out she went down there, did a little research, found out that there's one other church in New England that has a pulpit on the wrong end, a double cove ceiling, a curved balcony, and pine box pews. Rebecca Davis's childhood church in Mount Vernon, New Hampshire. I am here to confess to all and sundry that I thought Judy was on a wild goose chase and her goose laid a golden egg. Uh, there is no way this could be coincidence and it's a fascinating combination of features and also fascinating, if you're a step ahead of me, that a woman designed this church in the, you know, in, in the 1820s, no less. Now, did she sit down and tell Level Kelton it's gotta be this way and this way and I'm gonna draw it? We don't know. Uh, we know the result, we know the connection to her church, we don't know anything in between. It'd be wonderful if we could find a diary or something that would explain it in more detail. But we do know with a high degree of confidence that it was Rebecca behind all of this. Uh, the joke, of course, about the pulpit being on the wrong end is that if you come in late, everybody, including the pastor, has a chance to glare at you. You can't sneak into this church. I don't know if that explains the low attendance sometimes, but, uh, <laughs> but no. It's, uh, we just smile and embrace everyone who comes in whenever they come in. Right, Pastor? <laughs> yes, he says it's fine. All right. Uh, well, as I said, uh, when I got closer to the end, I would need to uh, talk faster and leave a couple things out. So the, the last couple of stories I have are a little quicker, but I think you'll find them interesting. Uh, story number five is the rise and fall of the Methodists. The original congregation was 150 to 200 people strong. At least a dozen families in attendance filled these pews with at least six children each. And you'll know some of the names, the Morses, the Templetons, the Pecks, the Cutlers, the Cummings, the Stevens, and as I mentioned before, the Nuts. Genealogical research uh, allowed us to come up with quite a few details, and I won't ask you to do this now, but you see the little numbers on the pews. Uh, these were the original numbers of the pews when people bought them to raise money for the church, and then they were, had the privilege of sitting in that pew. Uh, in the back of the hymnal where you're sitting are biographical details about the family that owned that pew or probably sat there in the 1820s. I spent several weeks of my life looking up in detail their genealogies and all their children's names and which ones lived and which ones died. So you are now morally obligated at some point to open that pew and look at that. 
Uh, there is also a map of the pew with the names of all the people who sat here in 1828. I chose that date because by then the church was finished and their first pastor, Reverend Dow, was established. And that was really the full beginning of the church as a congregation in a finished building. But it didn't last long. Uh, Methodist records show that there was a precipitous decline in membership starting about 10 years later, to the tune of 15 to 20 people leaving per year. Until by the 1860s, this building was virtually empty, and in 1872, the Methodists abandoned it altogether, and the church, which had purchased a house across the street, uh, about 100 yards down, as a parsonage, was sold for less than half what they'd paid for it. The whole thing was abandoned. What happened? Now, the obvious answer is, well, everybody was moving downtown. The city grew up around the river. Big mistake, as we've learned. And they knew then that it was prone to flooding, but they wanted the water power to run the mills, so that's where the town ended up. But that wasn't the whole explanation, because the churches down there started uh, to grow, and this started to shrink at about 20 years apart. There are a couple of other possible explanations. One is, this was a very old group to begin with, and they didn't replace themselves. Uh, they really started before the church was built, the leading families. And most of the older uh, men and women who led the church died in the 1840s. Unless the eldest son who got the land, which of course was all bought up by then, unless the eldest son who got the land was also a Methodist, they weren't coming here. And so they didn't replace themselves. A third explanation is that Methodism itself kind of lost its fizz about that time. It became a very conservative, staid, establishment church, no longer the evangelistic excitement with camp meetings and weekly meetings and mutual accountability and loud singing. It was polite. And polite doesn't recruit very well. <laughs> and they complained about it themselves at the time. So for a variety of reasons, the church languished at that point. But it didn't disappear. The building was maintained partly by rent from the city of Montpelier and then the city of East Montpelier. Because from 1828 to 1848, the town paid the church $50 a year to use the building for town meetings. And then from 1849 to 1890, East Montpelier, which was then formed, had its town meetings here until they built a building, a town hall, down in the East Village. So that was a primary source of revenue. The church was maintained primarily by local farmers who didn't have much money, didn't have a lot of wherewithal, but they kept it going by inviting preachers to come up from town occasionally to preach. I thought this went on for about 100 years, that the church was virtually derelict, and that's why it was uh, preserved in such pristine condition. Turns out there was a lot more interest and activity going on here during those years in the early 20th century and onward than we once thought. Again, partly thanks to Nathan Phillips, who dug up a lot of interesting newspaper articles, we know a lot about the people in the community and their activities here. Probably the key feature or the key event was in 1914, they started a Sunday school. And dozens of kids came from all around to this Sunday school. They met primarily in the schoolhouse next door because it was easier to heat. And then later, they purchased the building that's now the parish house. They called it the community hall. And uh, Sunday schools met there. But of course, the parents brought the kids. And what are they going to do? Stand around in the back? And they started talking about, well, what do we do? Maybe we should have more church meetings. And gradually that built up to the point that there were part-time preachers coming from out of town. And then they hired part-time preachers to come here on a regular basis or full-time in the summer. And then they started talking about maybe making this a full-time church in the 1950s and 60s. And that's what happened. The, the formal transition was in 1966, but it really wasn't that abrupt. It wasn't going from a corpse to a resurrection. It was really going from a very small body to a more formal body where they created bylaws and hired a full-time minister, which they shared with the Old Brick Church. I'd like to say a little about that uh, at the end, but there's one community event that I want to mention that I think you'll find interesting before I go there. 
This uh, has been, certainly since the middle of the 20th century, not just a church, but a community center. A lot of arts events, musical concerts. There were 4-H club meetings here. There were dances. They celebrated the end of World War II in that building. Uh, there were a lot of things that went on here. And probably the first, and one of the most interesting, was on the 7th of May, 1861, when the center meeting house was chosen as the site for a patriotic flag raising to honor the Union cause in the Civil War. There were hundreds of people here. They raised what they called a liberty tree, 120 feet tall, and they unfurled from it a 30 by 12 foot American flag. They had local politicians, including Addison Peck, who grew up sitting in this pew right here and was a local politician. And they had uh, Parley Pitkin, who lived across the street. He was the grandson-in-law of Parley Davis and the general in the local uh, First Vermont Brigade. They had a big celebration and uh, a bit of church and, uh, church and state mixed. Uh, and you might wonder, why did they do it here? Why didn't they do it in front of the state house? Well, it could be as simple as the fact that General Parley Pitkin lived across the street and it was his idea, we don't know, he would have been very influential. Uh, it could be because of visibility. Uh, the church stands at almost 1,100 feet, so you go up another 120 feet and you could see that flag for miles, much further than you could see from downtown, could see anything. Although there's a hill back here on Carroll's property that I think is about 1350, so you couldn't see it from downtown, but you could see it all the way to Owl's Head, I believe, I mean, and, and everything around, 120 foot flag. And it could be that they did it here because this is the only place you could find a 120 foot tree at the time. Everything had been cut down and it takes a, an enormous tree to set up as a flagpole. So maybe that was the reason. Uh, the Civil War was a l very live concern for Vermonters. I'm not sure you know, but 120 men from East Montpelier served in the Union Army in the Civil War and 27 of them died, 22 and a half percent enormous percentage. Uh, a dozen men who were part of this church served in the Civil War, and one of them died, Elthanan Ormsby, whose family had moved to the center in the 1830s. And in his eulogy, it was mentioned that he was one of the boys who raised that flag in 1861. He died in the Battle of the Wilderness in 1864. Last story that I think might interest you and, uh, and then I'll, I'll ask for a couple of questions and I don't wanna go test your patience too far beyond eight o'clock, but we did get started about 7.15, so I'm cheating a little here. <laughs> the, last, uh, the last story is 1995 and they split with the old brick church. I mentioned a group of neighbors drew up articles of constitution to reform this church in 1966 and they shared a pastor, a Reverend uh, Reginald Illingsworth with the Old Brick Church. Illingsworth was a Baptist who was already serving the Old Brick Church. The melding of the two congregations was really a, a mismatched marriage of convenience. This group needed the money uh, and joining with the other church allowed them to have a congregation. And like a lot of uh, poorly matched marriages, eventually the couple grew apart uh, irreconcilable, irreconcilable differences, I think, is the term. The old meeting house started more liberal or open theologically, and it grew even more so over time. It also added members. Uh, dramatically, under their pastor in the 1880s and 1990s, leading up to this split, uh, Hamilton Throckmorton, who was just here yesterday delivering the Bicentennial Sermon. The old brick chart church started more conservative and it became even more conservative over time. And it also shrank to the point that it needed the old meeting house, which was growing uh, so dramatically to help pay the bills, reversing the original arrangement. So when Hamilton Throckmorton left in 1994, uh, this group of people decided instead of going through another awkward attempt to hire a pastor who can please both churches, which was getting to be more and more difficult, maybe we should rethink the whole arrangement. And the writing you could sort of see was on the wall in the documents that they produced. 
But the two churches tried a democratic approach. They came up with three options. Keep the status quo, join churches, so you have one congregation but two buildings, just move back and forth between them, or split. And they decided they'd each vote, they'd eliminate the third choice, and then they'd vote again and have a runoff. Sounds very simple, but it didn't work very well because both churches, first choice was the third choice of the other church. <laughs> and so they, had, they went through all this rigmarole. And finally, the old brick church decided by just four votes that they wanted to merge congregations. And the old meeting house decided by just four votes that they wanted to be separated. And so that's what ended up happening. This church actually took the greater initiative um, to uh, create the separation. So the two churches had a rather awkward uh, service of separation, they called it, on the last day of 1995. And then on January 1st, 1996, they were two independent churches, and they have been so ever since. Old Meeting House ended up hiring a pastor from within, Susan Cook Kittredge, who'd been an intern, and former Catholic priest David Kittredge, and the church thrived under their leadership. In 2003, the church became uh, open and affirming, and in 2011, hired another successful pastor, Alyssa Junk, who in 2015 married Sarah Katz in the sanctuary. That happy event, which would probably have shocked the original church's founders, uh, was certainly emblematic of the congregation's openness to all, especially those who have been traditionally marginalized. But going back a century or more, one of the things that has impressed me most about the history of the place was the strength of women in leadership here, whose names aren't necessarily named, but when you start looking at the documents and between the lines and behind the scenes, you find that it was a group of strong, uh, God-loving, uh, wonderful women who kept this whole thing going for a hundred years against almost impossible odds, and I dare say are still doing so. Uh, for at least a century, this has been a focus of community activity, of arts, of culture, and of caring. Uh, I came here 10 years ago and have been thoroughly impressed by that, and as the church begins its third century, I believe these uh, endearing features will no doubt continue. Well, I pushed a little to get through that last bit and didn't ask for questions, but now let's have a few of those and then we'll see if people want to stay a bit longer. I'm still wired, I'm willing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We can't hear you. Uh, church. The old, and which church? The Adamant Church. Adamant. Adamant. Oh, have we found any relationship between the old meeting house and the church in Adamant? I have not come across a shred of evidence of connection, but a lot of that history is only going to be in diaries and personal memories and would probably not show up in newspaper articles a few of which are still emerging from time to time. So if there was a joint service, for example, if something happened commemorative here, they would have been invited and certainly would have come. I just haven't seen the record of it. So uh, that's my own ignorance, but not a negation. <laughs> uh, yes? Uh, do you know so, when this church got its name? Yeah. Uh, has it ever changed or has it always been? Sandal asked uh, when the church got its name. Obviously, it wasn't old for a long time. Uh, it was called the Center Meeting House, and then for a while, some of the documents referred to it as the Union Meeting House. I wonder if that got a little confusing with Union Meeting Halls. I'm not sure. But then they had the Sunday School Union, and it used the word, so that seemed okay. And then I kind of have to laugh because for a while it was called the Old White Church, which was not a description of the people, <laughs> I don't think, it was, <laughs> although it sort of was, uh, but the church was white and by that time it was old in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, the Old Meeting House uh, appellation, the first I've seen of it I think was 1940s, uh, and then it caught on increasingly, although it was still sometimes called the Center Meeting House or the uh, old uh, white church, uh, even into the 1950s and 60s. Uh, 
Barb, can you clarify that all? Do you recall the first reference to it as the old meeting house? Well, not the first, but the, the reconstitution, the constitution calls it. That. Yes, thank you. Barbara points out that the reconstituting group in 1966, informing bylaws and, and a covenant, had to have a name, and they chose Old Meeting House. So that's been its official uh, name since then. Yes? Do you know if Harley Davis's idea of the two other denominations using it in the off hours, is there any documentation of regular services? Yes, thank you. Did, did the church, in fact, uh, find use by the Universalists and the Congregationalists? Yes, and the only source we have for that, interestingly, well, one indirect source, uh, one source is Sophie Damon's book, where she talks about the fact that her parents told her to come to church and they heard all three denominations here in the church. The other is that we know that Parley Davis actually wrote letters to universalist leaders in New England asking them how it would be possible to form a universalist church here. He was still paying the bills for that itinerant preacher and hoping to pull it off so that there would be a building. If he'd lived long enough for the Methodist church to wane sufficiently, maybe you know, he could have gotten people in here, but I don't know how many Universalists there would have been to replace them when the Methodists moved out. The Universalists basically, by that time, were no longer the Universalists that I described. Later in the 19th century, the Unitarian Universalists became uh, more what we're familiar with today, less um, Orthodox, Evangelical, and more uh, focused on a reasoned approach to religion and spiritual growth. Um, my relatives were the Fosters who had those pews over yes. there. Yes. I happened to sit there yesterday. Oh. It's like pure coincidence. Yes. She, she's saying that your name is? Liza. Liza was saying that she uh, inadvertently sat in the pews that her ancestors sat in over in the corner of the Fosters, which was interesting. The Fosters had a huge family. They had 10 or 12 kids. And they had this pew back here and also this one here because there were too many kids to fit in one pew. Uh, so they were, there was quite, a, and then they were across from them, there was a bachelor who must have just been annoyed at the noise <laughs> and a couple of families that only had one kid each and it's like fosters, they're everywhere. Uh, but yes. my understanding is that they were, or in subsequent generations, very strong universalists. So do you think there were sort of compromises because they lived, it was sort of the closest church nearby so they would make do? Yes, there was a lot of movement and there were people who owned pews here who supported this financially because it was going to be the center church, but they never came here to church because they were universalists or they only came to the later surface service, not the Methodist service. And it's hard to figure out sometimes which one was which. Some of them changed over the course of time. And we have all kinds of stories that are uh, unspoken or implied by, you read the genealogy and you see one family lost like two children in a few months and then they moved to Ohio. Well, was there a correlation between them or, you know, there things like that you just wonder. Or one, one family, uh, were members of both the Universal Church and the Methodist Church, whose leaders were denouncing each other and consigning each other to eternal perdition, but people paying the bills in the pews were saying, eh, I'm going there after I leave here. <laughs> so, very Vermonty of them, I think. <laughs> Question? Yes. I, I just wanted to note that the Meeting House Society and Church Societies were separate, so that Well, that's probably typical, but I couldn't, I didn't find evidence of that in this particular place. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but when, when I look at the original trustees, they were also often the class leaders or Sunday school teachers. So they weren't just in charge of the building and the financing, they were also very much involved. That could be coincidence, and it may be uh, that, that in, throughout New England, the model that you suggest certainly makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah.
It could be that because it was more of a closed area here, it was just, it was just a fairly small group, and except for the Davises, they were pretty much all Methodists, so they, they all ran the place. But there were a few uh, exceptions to that, and, and I mention them in the, in, in the book. I can't remember all the names now, but I, I'm thinking of one who was a prominent attorney in town, and he had a pew here, and he was a church officer, but he was probably not a Methodist. So that, you know, that, that could confirm that. Others, yes, David. Just to follow up on what Lynn was talking about, could you talk a little bit about the secular use of the media? Because I think a lot of people in Montpelier do not know that this was their town hall. Yes. For 20 years yeah. before East Montpelier even existed. Right. I did, I did mention that, um, I didn't mention that from the 1790s to the 1828, uh, town meetings were in Parley Davis's house. From 1828 to 1848, they were here. And then when East Montpelier was split from Montpelier, East Montpelier town meetings continued to be here until 1890. So this was familiar to everyone as a town meeting location. And then the community hall, which is now the parish hall, was a, a community use building from the get-go. There were a lot of things other than church activities that took place there. And in fact, Carol and Fred have mentioned that and helped uh, uh, because they have recollections of you know, everything from uh, celebrating the end of World War II to 4-H meetings uh, occurring in the building. So yes, it's, uh, it has been that as well. Sarah? Um, from my perspective in the choir loft, I've become very aware of the cross up there and the fact that it is removable. In fact, I'm terrified of not over setting my choir books up there. Is, is that, was that deliberate so that in case this was uh, used for town um, hall? Uh, interesting question. Was, was the lack of explicit religious ornamentation in here due to the public use of the building. I, I can't say definitively. I would guess not. I think the building was designed this way because it was federal style, not because it was uh, secular or religious. And certainly the pulpit is the main focal point of any New England church built during this time. You can't get away from that. You'll notice there's no altar. The Methodists didn't want an, a fixed altar in their churches because it was too Catholic. Um, the focus would be on the sacrifice. And from the perspective of their beliefs, the sacrifice was done when Jesus died on the cross. No more sacrifice. That's what the papists do. So instead, there's a removable table. So communion takes place here, and the, and the congregants would walk up to this railing to take communion. But the altar was not a permanent fixture. The pulpit is the permanent fixture. Cross or no cross, it's the pulpit because it's the word of God, not the death on the cross, that's the focus from week to week. Two-hour sermons and your kids sit still through the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, sure. Wilbur Fisk uh, was asked to deliver a sermon to the state legislature in 1828. And you can look it up. It would take you four and a half hours to read it out loud. <laughs> he was not invited back. <laughs> I, I don't know if that was why, but they, they were long-winded preachers in those days. And uh, yeah, it probably convinced a lot of legislators to become universalists. I don't know. Wait, wait, question over here? Don't get any ideas from me. Yes. <laughs> Oh yes, they're bullet holes. Uh, this has nothing to do with any local conflicts. It has to do with local kids taking pot shots, according to Mark Catlin, using the, uh, the uh, fish up there on top of the steeple for target practice. It's a fish, by the way, not a cross. Uh, and that is a religious symbol. The early Christians used fish before they used crosses. And they used anchors as well. Crosses were considered shameful instruments of torture in the first and second century. You didn't wear them around your neck. So they used symbolic things like fish. Uh, and the word, Greek word for fish uh, is an acronym for Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior, uh, the beginning letters. So 
Fish was a big deal, and the church has a fish on top, not a cross. Yes, Susie. I was raised as a Methodist, and one of the th <laughs> <laughs> you were raised as a Methodist. How were you lowered? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, one of the things we knew growing up, and I wonder if you ran across information about this, that in the late 1830s, 40s, 50s, the, the Methodist Church just met a demise where I live, and it, it obviously did here, but it was mainly due to abolitionists, and, and I didn't know whether you ran across anything here. You know, oh, yeah. Here. Lots. Yeah, the, the Methodist Church was still the largest denomination in the United States all through the 19th century, up until the early 20th century. It was huge. But they split into multiple subgroups, uh, and one of the main divisions was over slavery. And Wilbur Fisk, the aforementioned Wilbur Fisk, was a, a main proponent of resettlement of freed slaves rather than outright abolition, because he believed that if the slaves were freed outright all at once, it would be terrible for them, and it would uh, throw the country into chaos. Well, he was right about that, but he gave up on the idea of resettlement before he died and realized that was a stupid idea too because it would cost billion, the equivalent of billions of dollars to send all the freed slaves back to Africa, and for what? <laughs> what would they do when they got there? So they realized that wasn't a good idea either. But the Methodist Church and a number of other denominations split over that. The Southern Methodists split away and reunited, I think, in the 1960s. Uh, took them a while um, to get back together. My recollection in the late 60s and, and 70s was that there were four denominations between the two churches. And I'm wondering which were the three that were here, which were the not the common two of uh, the, When the church was reconstituted in 1966, what were the denominations involved? There were four, sure I get this right, they, they were uh, Methodist, Baptist, uh, Universalist, and I think Congregational were the four. And um, the um, Congregationalists ended up becoming the United Church of Christ, and the Universalists and the Methodists kind of fizzled out for lack of interest on either side, and the people with more Baptist leanings tended to gravitate toward the old brick church. So the bylaws here initially named all four of those denominations, but the main group of people who reconstituted the church in 1966 were fiercely independent from a religious standpoint and for the most part didn't want to align with any one of those four denominations. And they ended up prevailing, really. The church has never officially aligned with any denomination even though most of its pastors for the last 40 or 50 years have been United Church of Christ. It's not officially a UCC church even now. I, I mentioned in the book, it may look like a duck and walk like a duck and squack like a duck, but it's not a United Church of Christ church. So, uh, yes? Oh, 1849 was when the split occurred. And there were politics involved that I don't thoroughly understand. Some of you probably do. But uh, the three quarters, the northern three quarters of the original Montpelier is now East Montpelier. And the southern chunk is Montpelier. Did that have anything to do with the train coming into Did it have to do with the train? Does any, can anyone speak definitively to that? Parley Davis, incidentally, among many hats that he wore, was the first uh, person who pushed for having a train service come through here. He and Rebecca just did everything. Yes. I don't really know whether it had to do with the train. I don't believe it did. We didn't discover that. Um, the Montpelier had become a village in the 1800s. Uh, the Montpelier had become a village in 1818, and by 1848, it was ready to get rid of the farming area because the roads were too expensive. Uh -huh. okay. uh, they were actually aiming to be, you know, a, 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 the state capital, uh, only the state capital, and, 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 and that was their image. So the people in Montpelier initiated the division, um, and the East Montpelier people were 
what sort of reform they, they, they have the clout to fight it, but they end up being pretty happy with that. <laughs> okay. Just reiterating that very briefly for the sake of those who, who can't hear from that distance, there were political things involved having to do with wanting to establish the capital and to distinguish what we call the downtown area, what they call the village, from this, these hillbillies up here, <laughs> this rural, uh, uh, unpaved, expensive to maintain area. Yes? You know, you said that Parley and Rebecca had quite the partnership, and you spoke to the women. I hope you all know that Rebecca Peabody was known as a doctor, not just a midwife. She was known as a physician. She was trained as a physician by Colonel and Dr. Moses Nichols, who trained several others in that southern part of New Hampshire where she grew, where she grew up. She was quite a skilled woman. She could do amputations. Yeah, she was uh, amazing in a lot of ways. I mean, I like her best because of the way she handled uh, the Chester Wright situation, uh, but somebody else whose leg she fixed probably liked her better for that. Uh, also interesting, the third minister of the church was James Templeton, who grew up here, and he became a doctor after he left the ministry because he was at a minister's conference in the city in Boston, and he had some ailment and he asked doctors about it and he was so impressed he decided, oh, I've become a doctor. And his two sons became doctors. So there were actually three generations of Templeton doctors operating out of this neighborhood, but no more ministers after that. And the Templetons also took in three to five black preachers, itinerant preachers. Hmm who traveled the area. Yeah, um, th which is another topic altogether. The, um, uh, there were two uh, Montpelier people, one East Montpelier, one who lived downtown by Shaw's, who were active in harboring runaway slaves. Uh, as far as we know from the historical records, they weren't hidden here because it was too far north to need to hide them, uh, but uh, they were helped along the way. So there is, uh, even here in Lily White, Vermont, there is some history of, of positive uh, uh, impact on the whole uh, racial divide of the country, especially during that period. Well, I think we're, uh, we're now at 827, so I've exceeded even the 15 minutes that I gave myself uh, for starting late. So thank you so much for your attention. Mary will be around if anybody's interested in a book, and thank you.